Let's go back to our problem of predicting whether our friend is bluffing while playing poker from face color and mouth angle. To demonstrate the XOR problem, we're going to reduce this problem of bluff detection into a binary possibility space that's suitable for binary operators like XOR. We're going to reduce our problem down by imagining that we have another friend who has only two types of face color, pale versus red, and only two types of mouth angle, smile versus frown. In order to model this binary situation, we still need to give the model some numerical representation of the two face colors and mouth angles. But now, because we only have two face colors, red versus not, and two mouth angles, smile versus frown, we should change our representation of the data to reflect its binary nature. We'd represent each of these binary states with the values of 0 or 1. It doesn't matter which value we map to a 0 and which value we map to a 1. So it doesn't matter if red is a 1 and pale is a 0, or red is a 0 and pale is a 1. Same goes for whether smile or a frown should be represented with a 0 or 1. We just have to be consistent with knowing what we decided to represent with a 0 or 1, and then the model will figure out the correct weights and bias for the representations that we choose. I'm not going to go through the numerical calculations for this binary example like I did for our previous poker examples, but I want you to understand that a numerical representation of the data will still be used to input to the model. In order to understand XOR in relation to our bluff detection problem, let's first go through its logical counterparts, the AND and OR problems. The AND and OR problems actually are linearly separable. So they are problems that our perceptron model can solve. Remember, our perceptron model works like this. It waits for input. Now we have two-dimensional input, which is mouth angle, which we represent with x1, and face color, which we represent with x2. Here we've reduced our problem space so that x1 and x2 can only take on two values, but the equations work the same and the perceptron will find values of weights w1 and w2 so that w1 times x1, the mouth angle, plus w2 times x2, the face color, plus a bias term b, will create a plane that intersects the graph that will separate the truth from the bluff. Now if we have an and situation that predicts a bluff, for example, red and smiling, this would correspond to the data point in the lower right-hand corner in this picture shown, and the perception would find weight values corresponding to this division between truth and bluff, so that only red and smiling would predict a bluff. Now, if we instead had an OR situation for predicting a bluff, such that there is a bluff if our friend has a red face or is smiling, and remember this is a lenient OR, so it can be only red or only smiling, or both red and smiling. Well, this corresponds to the data point on the left bottom, which is a red face, though not smiling, and also a data point on the right bottom, which satisfies both red and smiling, which is allowed with the lenient OR, and also the top right data point, which is smiling but not red, and thus satisfies red or smiling. Again, this is a linearly separable problem, and the perceptron can find values of weights 1 and weights 2 to separate truth from bluff. Now let's look at an XOR. XOR means that the solution can only be either red or smiling, but not both red and smiling. This means that your friend is bluffing when they are smiling and not red, or red and not smiling, but not both. This corresponds to the data points in the bottom left and the upper right. Now we don't have a single line that can be drawn to separate the data between truth and bluff. Remember, the single neuron can only handle linearly separable problems, which in two dimensions means that the different output values can be separated with a single straight line. We've hit the limits of a single neuron model, which is what we saw in the last lecture. 
A single neuron will not be able to detect a friend that is bluffing only when they are pale and smiling or red and frowning. Now I want to show you how two single neurons can be combined to handle this non-linearly separable XOR problem that a single neuron cannot handle. XOR is actually equivalent to the intersection of two linearly separable problems. Let's see how this works. Let's take all the data points that satisfy the output of the smiling or red model. These are all the faces that are either smiling or red, or both red and smiling. Then let's look at the data points that satisfy the model not both smiling and red. This means all faces other than the red smiling face. When you combine the criteria of these two individual models, you end up with the XOR, which is either a face that is pale and smiling or a face that is red and frowning. We can see that we get the solution to XOR by intersecting the solutions to these individual problems that just have a single separable line that a single neuron model could solve. Let's see how we can combine the outputs of two single neurons into a third neuron, such that this third neuron solves the XOR problem. We have our two neurons, and they both have their linearly separable solution. Neuron 1 is designed to detect everything that is smiling or red. This means we've trained it so that it can find values for its two weights and its bias, such that it detects input satisfying the criteria of red or smiling, and it will output a value of 1 if this is the case, which means our friend is bluffing, and otherwise it will output a 0. Now let's say we have a second neuron that's designed to detect inputs that are not both red and smiling. This means that neuron 2 will have found values for its two weights and a value for its bias such that it will output a 1 when the input is not both red and smiling and will output a 0 when the input is both red and smiling. So these are two individual neurons that solve these respective linearly separable problems. If we feed the outputs of these two neurons as inputs to a third neuron, we now have a third neuron that receives two-dimensional inputs, where the first input dimension is the output of neuron 1. We're going to call this x1. And then the second dimension is the output of neuron 2, which we call x2 here. Before, for our single neurons, we had x1 being the mouth angle and x2 being the face color. But now we have this third neuron, and its inputs are not directly mouth angle and face color. The inputs to this third neuron are the outputs from neuron 1 and neuron 2. So now our new x1 is the output from neuron 1, and our new x2 is the output from neuron 2. Let's train this third neuron to compute an AND operation on its inputs, which are the outputs of the two neurons. This means that this third neuron is trained to detect when the output of both neuron 1 and neuron 2 are equal to 1. This means that the face input that's been received has satisfied both neuron 1 and neuron 2's criteria. This third neuron computes an AND operation on the outputs of neurons 1 and 2, and so neuron 3 now is able to represent an XOR problem. This third neuron will detect when faces are either both smiling and not red, or both red and not smiling, and nothing else. This means that neuron 3 has found its own values of the two weights and bias so that it can detect this XOR situation. Weight 1 of neuron 3 is going to be multiplying the input from neuron 1, and then weight 2 of neuron 3 is going to be multiplying the input from neuron 2. Again, neuron 3 does the same computation of all individual neurons, which is to sum the weighted inputs, add the bias, and feed this through an activation function.
Neuron 3 will have an output table that looks like this. This output table is written with respect to the inputs from Neuron 1 and Neuron 2. Neuron 3 will only output a 1, which represents a bluff, when the inputs from both neurons, x1 and x2, is equal to 1. Notice here that when we look at Neuron 3's outputs in terms of its inputs, x1 and x2, which are the outputs of Neuron 1 and Neuron 2, Neuron 3 is locally solving a linearly separable problem. Even though the problem it's solving relative to mouth angle and face color is not linearly separable, the problem it's solving relative to its own inputs, which are the outputs of neuron 1 and neuron 2, that is a linearly separable problem. Considering the local inputs to neuron 3, x1 and x2, the work of neuron 3 is just like that of any other single neuron perceptron. Neuron 3 is solving a linearly separable problem with respect to its own inputs. However, because its inputs are coming from other neurons that have fed their results through a nonlinear activation function, Neuron 3 is solving a nonlinear problem with respect to the original data input of faces. Let's see how this all works together. When the input is a face that is neither smiling nor red, the output of neuron 1 is 0, and the output of neuron 2 is 1. This does not satisfy what neuron 3 is looking for, because neuron 3 wants the output of neuron 1 and neuron 2 to be equal to 1. So the output that neuron 3 is going to give is a 0, which means your friend is telling the truth. Now let's say we see a face that is red and smiling. The output of neuron 1 is going to be 1. The output of neuron 2 is going to be 0. Again, this does not satisfy what neuron 3 is looking for, which is that both neuron 1 and neuron 2 are equal to 1. And so neuron 3 again outputs a 0. Now let's see the cases when the faces are either pale and smiling or frowning and red. Here, Neuron 1 will output a 1, and Neuron 2 will also output a 1. Now Neuron 3 has the AND situation that it's been looking for, where Neuron 1 and Neuron 2 are outputting a 1. So Neuron 3 now outputs a 1, and this means that your friend is bluffing. Even though Neuron 3 is solving a simple, linearly separable problem with respect to its own local inputs, x1 and x2, it is solving a non-linearly separable XOR problem with respect to the input face data. From this example, we see why multi-neuron networks are needed, and how a single neuron can receive inputs from other neurons to form large neural networks that can solve more complex problems. This is the end of our lecture on how a three-neuron network can be used to solve a non-linearly separable XOR problem. This is to give you an intuition for how multi-neuron networks combine the computations of single neurons together to be able to solve more complicated problems. In the next lecture, we'll introduce what's known as the Universal Approximation Theorem, which is a theorem that says that a multi-neuron network can theoretically represent any continuous function, and therefore, theoretically, it can find the most complicated way of separating different data points that we might need in order to make predictions. I'll also be showing you in the next lecture an intuitive idea of a proof for why this is the case.